Judges chapter 13, reading from verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, So now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that it was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when the words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah, Manoah knew that it was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or such things or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and she called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him, stir him in Mahanaet Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. Well, it's a real blessing to continue in the book of Judges, uh, to be reminded again of God's faithfulness, our own human weakness, and our need of a true and righteous judge. All these things have been pointed to again and again in the book of Judges. Now, if you were here last week, uh, we looked at Judges chapter 12 together, looking at the story of Jephthah and the judges that came after him. And as we looked at that passage, as we looked at Jephthah, I sought to draw out three or four dangers from the text which pose threat to the people of God. There were dangers in the Old Testament, and there are also dangers today for the New Testament church. 
that the first danger we saw in our passage was the danger of infighting. There was an argument between Jephthah and the Gileadites and the Ephraimites, and it led to 42,000 people lying dead on the battlefield. It was a reminder to us of the danger of pride, the danger of disunity, and that things can escalate quickly until the people of God are scattered everywhere. It's a terrible thing when God's people argue with one another in this way. How can it be avoided? It's only as we keep in step with the Spirit, isn't it? As we maintain the unity and the bond of peace that the Apostle Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. So that was the first danger, the danger of infighting. The second danger we saw was the danger of sexual immorality. After Jephthah died, there arose another judge. His name was Ibzan. And what did Ibzan do? He took his daughters and his sons and he married them to the pagan nations. Uh, something which God had absolutely forbidden them to do in the book of Deuteronomy. He married his people outside of Israel. And that led to, to death and destruction within the nation, as it always does when we disobey God's commands. It was a reminder to us, wasn't it, of the danger that sexual immorality poses to the people of God. That as Christians, we're not to marry unbelievers, we're only to marry in the Lord. We're not to be unequally yoked together, but remain separate. Not even allowing a hint of sexual immorality in the church. The final danger we saw in the passage, and it was kind of two in one, was the danger of mediocrity and materialism. After Ibzan died, there were another two judges. And they didn't really do anything. One guy just faded away into the, into the darkness, that was him. And another guy collected 70 donkeys. That was his legacy. It was a reminder to us that we've been called to do more than just collect stuff in this world or just die without making an impact and go off into the darkness. These two sins are more serious than all the others put together. Churches which just curse and are mediocre and other churches which just hoard goods for themselves and individual Christians. The only legacy they leave is a material one. It's a great danger for us in the West, isn't it, with our affluence and our many things which we have possession-wise. So not the most positive passage, three dangers we saw there, but it was the message that the chapter brought to us. So as we come to Judges 13 tonight, we begin a new chapter, and we actually start a new section in the book of Judges. Uh, For the next four chapters, the book actually just slows down as it slowed down on Gideon's life and others, it slows down now to focus on the life of Samson, of the circumstances of his birth, as we've seen tonight. We'll look at his obedience, his disobedience, and the tragic, bittersweet end of his life. It's one of the more well-known stories in the book of Judges, isn't it? The story of Samson. And it still has lessons to teach us today. It's still valuable for the New Testament church to learn from so many lessons about temptation, about the call to obedience and about God's faithfulness, even when we're unfaithful to him. So today, as we come to this passage, as we go through Judges 13, I won't break it down into points for us. We'll just take a walk through the story as the story appears. And then after that, we'll ask some questions. You know, what sort of lessons do we learn from this story? What are some of the take homes for us today? And I trust as we do that, we'll see again God's faithfulness. A faithfulness which points us to the ultimate provision which will be made in the person of Christ. So with that in mind, then let's come to the first verse and follow through with this amazing story. So just taking a bird's eye view now of Judges chapter 13. At this point in the book of Judges, we've seen a number of different judges come on the scene, haven't we? We saw Ehud, the left-handed saviour, who stabbed the fat guy in the stomach. You remember that chapter? Uh, Shamgar with the ox god who killed 600 men. The war of Deborah and Barak. Uh, We've seen Jael with a tent peg when she crushed the man's temple and skull um, and brought victory to Israel. We've seen Gideon, the mighty man of valour, and Jephthah, the man who made the rash vow. We've gone through some judges now in the book of Judges. You can clearly see it's not really working. And the judges now are becoming slowly and slowly more corrupt. 
What's happened as we come to the start of this chapter? Well, it's that all too familiar introduction, isn't it? Look at verse one. You could have copied and pasted this from another place in the book of Judges. Very familiar words to us, verse one. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. It's almost how the chapters always begin, isn't it? Again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And yet when you look closer here at verse 1, there's something a bit different here, isn't there? Have you noticed it? Have you noticed what's different there? The people are not crying out to God in prayer anymore. Normally it says the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, then they cried for mercy and God raises up a deliverer. But here they are in sin and they're not even crying for help anymore. They've got so used to being oppressed by their enemies, so used to being in sin, they've become so hard-hearted. It's as though they've just accepted it. It's as though they've just gone along with what's happened. They've become calloused. You know, a bit like when you play the guitar, you're playing it every day and your fingers get hard. You don't feel any pain anymore. You can shred the guitar, you can press on the strings, you don't feel anything. Well, their hearts have become calloused. They don't feel anything anymore. They don't care about God anymore. They're not even crying out for mercy anymore. And yet even when they're in this state, even when they've got into this terrible place, God hasn't forgotten them. He's still working things behind the scenes for their good. And even though they failed to ask for deliverance, God's still going to bring it. He's still working behind the scenes with his covenant people to raise up a deliverer. Look with me at verse two there. It says, there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the, of the Denites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. So we zoom out from the big picture and we zoom into this little family and you see that they're in a situation of childlessness. Manoah and his wife are God-fearing people. They loved the Lord. And yet here they are struggling with infertility. It happens to people in this world, doesn't it? Even to God's people sometimes, they struggle with infertility. And yet in this instance, in the book of Judges in chapter 13, God's going to deliver them from this childless. Let's look at verse 3 of the angelic visitation. Verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. It's the news that any barren couple would wish to hear, isn't it? And especially when an angel comes to announce it to you. You'd have this sense that this child's not only going to be born, it's not only going to be a blessing from God, it's going to be a special child. In fact, when you read through the Old and the New Testament, whenever there's an angel comes to announce someone's birth, it's always big news, isn't it? Jacob, Isaac, Samuel, John the Baptist, all of their births were announced before they happened. And it always marks a shift in salvation history. It's the same here with Manoah and his wife. When God opens the womb in this way, when he opens the womb and and gives the angelic announcement, there's always change on the way. And so for Manoah's wife, she's given some very specific instructions from the angel about how she's to conduct herself during the pregnancy. Verse four and five, she says, therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. He said, not only is the child going to be set apart, I need you to set yourself apart, even to give birth to this child. He's going to be devoted to God from the womb, just as John the Baptist was in the New Testament. And did you notice there that he's going to be a special kind of Jew? He's going to be a Nazarite. Now, Manoah and his wife, straight away, they would have thought, oh, we know exactly what that is, but maybe you and I need a quick reminder. Numbers chapter six, let me read to you about the Nazarite vow. This is what it meant to be a Nazarite to God. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, Whenever a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any, ju any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. All the days of separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head. Until the time is complete for which he separates himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. He shall let the locks of his head and head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even for his father or his mother or for brother or sister. If they die and he touches them, they shall make himself unclean because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. So it's quite an intense vow to take, isn't it? You're not going to drink any wine. You're not going to eat any grapes. And even if your parents die, you're not going to be able to go to their funeral. You're not going to touch the body. You are set apart for God. It's a serious vow to take, isn't it? And this child's going to be a Nazarite from birth. You know, in New Zealand, you sometimes hear of one of these mongrel mob children has been patched from birth. Well, he was a Nazarite from birth. He didn't have a say in it. He was to follow the Lord wholeheartedly from his infancy. Maybe this one's going to be the judge who finally brings peace to Israel, who finally subdues God's enemies and finally subdues the sin which is in Israel's heart. So the message, who, who did it come to the message? It came to Manoah's wife, didn't it? She was the, the one who seemed to set the lead in spiritual things. She heard the news first. Manoah wasn't there. And so his wife, she explained the situation to him in verse 6. Look with me there. So then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me. His appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And Manoah, he's not really that ready to listen to his wife, is he? It's, it's, he doesn't really like what she said. He doesn't seem to believe the message. It's a big call what she's just said, isn't it? Not only is, she gonna, is this period of infertility going to end, but the child who's going to be born is going to be special. He's not allowed to drink wine. He's never allowed to cut his hair. Manoah, rightly or wrongly, he wants to get confirmation for himself. Look at verse 8. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you send come again to teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. He's clearly not paid too much attention to what his wife just said because she's just told him the instructions of how the child should be born. But sometimes as men, we don't listen to our wives. And so he's asking God to confirm it. And God says in verse nine, and God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not there. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. I'm not sure why the angel of the Lord didn't appear to Manoah directly. Again, it went back to his wife, probably to show that you should have listened to her in the first place. You should have believed what she said. You should have had faith and not doubted. But the angel appears to his wife again. And Manoah comes over. This time he's got a few questions. He wants to hear it first hand. Verse 11. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? It's all already been said, of course. But in verse 13, the angel repeats it. The Lord said to Manoah, of all that I have said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine. Neither let her drink, drink wine or strong wine or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded, let her observe. Essentially, the angel said, listen to your wife. I've already explained all of it to her. Why are you not listening? 
probably feeling a bit humbled at this point, didn't need the second visitation, didn't need to be confirmed, could have just, just listened to what she told him. But he's also in awe of this angel of the Lord, isn't he? So much so that he kind of panics in the presence of this holy one and he offers him something to eat. Look at verse 15. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prefer a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that it was the angel of the Lord. So if you know your Bible well, if you're thinking back to some of these Old Testament events, it's not the first time that someone's tried to feed the angel of the Lord, is it? Do you remember Abraham in, in the book of Genesis by the tents of Mamre? He tried to feed the man who came to him, didn't he? The angel of the Lord, he said, I'm going to cook you a meal, a goat. He said, I don't have any appetite for this meal. At Gideon, when he was hiding in the wine press, he said, oh, I'll cook you a meal, a goat. It must have been the hot dish to serve to someone who was visiting. And he, again, he told him, I don't have any appetite for the goat. Offer it as a burnt offering. Now it's the third time in the Old Testament someone sees this angel of God and panics and thinks that he, he must be hungry not realizing he has no appetite at all for human food. And then the angel says something strange, doesn't he? He says, offer it as a burnt offering. And of course, as a Jew, you know in your mind that the only one who can receive a burnt offering is God himself. You can't offer a burnt offering to anyone else. God would smoke you. God would destroy you. He says, only me you can worship. Worship the Lord your God alone. And now the, the angel's effectively saying, the messenger, worship me. His head's really turning now, isn't it? Verse 17, Manoah's starting to think a bit more clearly about what's going on. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. The angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. And at this point, Manoah's probably even more confused, isn't he? What, what does he mean? He's, he's got this wonderful name, is he? Could it be God himself who's standing before me? Doesn't ask any more questions. He just makes the offering. And we see the amazing results there in verse 19 to 21. So Manoah took the young goat with the great off, grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching and when the flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The messenger, which is the same word for angel in the Greek and Hebrew, the messenger has gone up in the flames and up into heaven itself. A terrifying thing to see, wouldn't it? A display of glory when the one who has been speaking to you becomes one with the all-consuming flame and ascends into the heavens. It's not something you see every day, is it? And then we're told, verse 21, then the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that it was the angel of the Lord. And who's the angel of the Lord? Well, we've seen him before many times in the scriptures, but it's the pre-incarnate Christ, isn't it? For the first time, Manoah says something which is half right. Look at verse 22. He's only half right, but he still says the truth here. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. He's half right. They have seen God and they're still alive, but he's only half right because they're not going to die. Who was the messenger? We know it's the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate one, the eternal messenger of Yahweh, the one who will take flesh and become the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of those theophanies, a pre-incarnate appearing. The second person of the Trinity taking human form, not for years and not forever, but just temporarily. Manoah realizes this, I've seen God. He's a Jew, he knows that no one can see God and live. And so he's panicking, we're going to die, we're going to be destroyed. He doesn't have much faith, does he, in the promises of God. He's not really listened to the message, he's just been overwhelmed by the whole experience. And in this passage, it's his wife who has to instruct him. Look at verse 23. But his wife said to him, we don't even know a name, do we? But his wife said to him, 
If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. In other words, she says, Manoah, get a grip. You're not thinking properly. You're not leading well. You're, about, you're acting like a madman. The Lord's not gonna, he's not gonna destroy us when he's just accepted the offering from our hands and made great and precious promises to us. What are you thinking about? You know, Manoah's wife really is the example in this passage, isn't she? She hears the promises of God. She believes the promises of God. And the promises of God come true in her life. She's the one who's given the honor of giving birth to the child, of looking after him, of keeping herself pure for him. And God is faithful to his word in verses 24 to 25. Look with me there. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him at Mahanendan between Zorah and Eshtol. She was faithful to, to God's word. She believed the promise. And so Samson was born. The Lord predicted his coming. He was set apart from birth. He was filled with the spirit of God. Perhaps he will be the one to bring, bring deliverance. It's a great new beginning for the people of God, isn't it? This birth of this special child right in the midst of a book of absolute chaos. It's a new beginning. It's a great story of God's grace. And so now let's ask the all important question because this is always the most important question. What are the lessons we learn from a passage like this? What does this story instruct us in? What is God speaking to us in this text and what does he want us to do in response? Well, I think there's a couple of lessons for us here in the text. At firstly, as you read through this passage, it's a passage of contrast, isn't it? You see throughout the text, the contrast between Manoah, the faithless man, doesn't believe God's promises, struggles with God's promises and his faithful believing wife Manoah is just like one of the typical Israelites at this time. He's slow to believe, he's slow to trust. And even when God's moving by his spirit and things are happening, Manoah doesn't even recognize it. Once again, in the book of Judges, a woman is leading the charge. We don't even know her name, but it looks like she's the spiritual leader of the family, doesn't it? She believes God, she exhorts her husband, he's not stepping into his role. As you read through the book of Judges again and again, you see the failure of men to lead. And brothers and sisters, don't we see the same thing today? Would it not be true that in some families, the woman is the head of the home? She's the spiritual leader and the man is passive and doesn't step into the role God has given him. I know it's true in some families, the women run the show spiritually, they disciple the kids, they pray for their family, they lead spiritually because the men simply refuse to do it. You know, we see it today and we're quick to point the finger as, as men, you know, when women do this, but often it's not the woman's fault, is it? Often she's been forced into this position because the men have completely abdicated their God-given responsibilities. We've definitely slipped far away from what we should be, often as men. And do you know how the old Puritans used to speak about the man in the house? They would say that the man should exercise his role as the prophet, priest, and king of his family, imitating the Lord Jesus Christ the one who is himself prophet, priest, and king. As the prophet, we're meant to open the scriptures to our family, explain it to them, disciple our children. As the priest, we're to pray for our family, we're to lay down our lives for our family. As the king, we're to exercise a rule in our household and be in charge of the discipline. A servant king, yes, that's true, but a king nonetheless, one who imitates Christ in his roles. As men, we need to look at this story and ask ourselves, am I leading my family well? Yes, of course, we need the encouragement of our wives. Of course, their help is suitable for us. But there's a difference between that and your wife wearing the trousers and running the house. 
Pray that God would help those of us who are men to lead our own families well, not to be like Manoah when the spirit of God's moving and not even recognising it. And it's the wives who have to take charge in the home. That's one of the great failures at the time of the judges, isn't it? The men gave up and the women had to step into the space. That's one of the things that comes out from this text, for sure. So more positively, for the ladies who are married in our congregations, Manoah's wife is a great example of godliness in the home, isn't she? She prays, she trusts God, she helps her husband even when he's been a bit slow and a bit stupid. She's gracious and patient with him, just as you need to be gracious and patient with the man that you're married to as well. You don't need to listen to this, this message and then go home and give your husband an ear bashing and say, you need to be less like Manoah. No, encourage your husband. Show him kindness and respect even before he becomes the man that he should be and watch him grow into that role in confidence. This is another takeaway from Judges 13. Women, be like Manoah's wife. She's a godly woman. She's worthy of our imitation. Another important lesson you get here, it is an important one, is that God, God the Son, second person of the Trinity, the angel of Yahweh, is able to appear in human form even in the Old Testament. He can take to himself human form and come and preach for a few hours and go back to heaven. There's no limitations on God. The Jews don't like passages like this. They don't preach on passages like this. But it's there, isn't it? And if God can take to himself human flesh for three hours, come down and burn a goat and then go back up in the clouds, he can take to himself human flesh forever. There's no hindrance at all. And that's what he did when the word became flesh. You know, in this moment, a God the Son second person of the Trinity, he puts on humanity a bit like we put a hat on. He puts it on, he does what he needs to do, he takes it off. But that's not what happened when Christ became man. He took human flesh to himself forever and he's still in the human flesh now. We'll see a man, a real man, glorified of course, but in human flesh. He didn't take his humanity on and off like a hat. He stands there, a real man in heaven, the man Christ Jesus. And so a foundation's been laid in all these Old Testament passages for the coming of the Son. You ever speak to a Jew, ask him about who did, who did Abraham see? Who did Isaiah see in the temple? Who did Manoah see? No one can see God. How is it that they said that they could see him? It's because his glory was hidden in human flesh. And that lays the foundation for Christ, doesn't it? The one who appears for 33 years. In appearance as a man. So as much as there are moral lessons about husbands and wives in this passage, there are lessons about theophanies. As much as all that is true and good, this passage is ultimately pointing us to Jesus Christ, isn't it? As you think of the birth of Samson, it's hard not to think of the birth of Jesus Christ as it were been pointed forward to those great events. How do we see it? Well, just as Samson's birth was announced by God to his people, so too the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was announced from heaven, wasn't it? Uh, do you remember that famous verse, Luke chapter six, uh, 1, verse 26? I'll read it to you. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Of course, Jesus' birth is unique in that it's a, a virgin birth. There's no sexual intimacy involved. But both people were predicted beforehand by angels. Samson is a type of Jesus Christ. 
Just as he was to be set apart from the womb, so too the Lord Jesus was set apart from his womb, filled with the Spirit beyond measure for the task that God had given him. They had a similar birth, and they grew up, both of them called to serve God. But that's where you see the similarities are going to stop. Samson went one way, he went the way of of disobedience. Christ walked the path of perfect righteousness. Samson gives in to almost every temptation there is. Christ never gives in to any temptations. And yet when they come to their death, it's a similar circumstance, isn't it? What happens to Samson? He ends up blinded in the temple of Dagon. You know the story. He pushes the pillars out. He kills the enemies of God. But he has to sacrifice himself to do it. What happens to Jesus Christ at the end of his life? He ends up blindfolded, struck by the high priest, beaten, whipped, scourged, and his arms like Samson's are stretched out on a wooden cross and he dies there to save the enemies of God from hell. There's going to be many types and shadows you're going to see. As we go through the story of Samson, there's going to be things which are similar to Christ, things which are the the exact opposite. But all the time, we're going to be pointed to Jesus. As I said this morning, the whole Old Testament points to him. What did the Lord Jesus say? He said, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the scriptures have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer and enter into his glory, just as the Old Testament predicted? This is the one we've been pointed to in in Samson's birth. You've always got to be here in the echo of Christ. Because it's there you'll find strength to be different. He's the one who can break not only the power of God's enemies over us, but the enemies on the inside. The power of sin, death, and hell. How can we hope to be better than Israel? How can we hope to be better husbands, not like Manoah? How can we hope to be better wives like Manoah's wife? It's through Jesus Christ, isn't it? Through the one who laid down his life for us, the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, not just for a few hours, but for forever. The one who remains a man to this hour. Pray that we'd look to him together. Pray that he'd give us the strength to live the Christian life here in Gisborne in the coming days, the coming years, and to the end of the age. Amen.